Greetings, I'm Howard Gardner. I'm speaking to you from the library at the Harvard Graduate School of Education in Cambridge, Mass. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person for the celebration at the UWC Southeast Asia, but if the technology works, I will be able to have a brief discussion with you after the formal talk. So my talk is divided into three parts. Um, the first and longest part is a discussion of the research that my colleagues and I have been doing for many years on the question, what is good work? In part two, I'll talk about how do you assess impact of an enterprise that you've been involved in for a long period of time. And in the third part, I'll speak briefly about a four-year study of the United World Colleges Network, which we've recently completed. So what is good work? This is a question that was posed over 25 years ago by three psychologists from left to right, William Damon, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, and yours truly, Howard Gardner. We looked a bit younger <laughs> in, that, in that time of pictures. Unfortunately, uh, Professor Csikszentmihalyi died about a year ago, but uh, Professor Damon and I are continuing this work on good work. And the question we ask over 25 years ago is this, how do people who want to do good work succeed or fail? And at the time we said things are changing very quickly. Our sense of time and space is being radically altered by technology. Market forces are very powerful and there are few of any counter forces of equivalent power. If this sounds like a very timely set of questions, it is because in 2022, we could ask Gaki the same set of questions. What did we do? We conducted in-depth interviews with over 1,500 individuals from nine different domains or professions, which included K-12 education, higher education, and other professions. And we talked to people at all different phases of their career, high school students, novices, professionals in training, people in mid-career, and veterans or trustees. I should emphasize this work was carried out almost entirely in the United States 25 years ago and continuing. And so it's an open question to what extent our answers would be applicable in other societies. But you have to start somewhere. And as citizens of the United States, that's where we began in 1995. So here's an example of a lawyer we might have interviewed. Here's an example of a physician we might have interviewed. And here, somewhat closer to home, is a chemistry teacher whom we might have interviewed. 1,500 interviews, nine different professions. Each interview lasted about an hour. Some of them went up to two and a half hours. People love to talk about work when they have a sympathetic audience. So what did we discover is good work? We didn't know the answer. That's why we talked to so many people. And we're going to talk about three key findings, the ease of good work, the importance of alignment, and what we call circles of responsibility. And again, these were findings which came from the interviews of over 1,500 people in nine professions, different stages of the career in the United States. Here's probably the most um, important finding Good work is composed of three elements. It's excellent, it's engaging, and it's carried out in an ethical manner. Excellent means the worker knows his or her stuff. Whether they're a lawyer or a journalist or a teacher, they know what they're doing. Engagement is very important. They care. Um, they like going to work. They enjoy their friends, their colleagues. They work extra if needed. Um, it's, working has meaning for them. Third, and most important for today's talk, they have a sense of what it means to be ethical, and they try very hard to behave in an ethical way. Ethics means what do you do when there's a problem in your work, and what you shouldn't do? What you should do is not obvious. You have to think about it. That's what ethics is about. And if you look at the graphic, we intertwine these three E's. Um, and we call it ENA, poking fun at DNA. And 
if you are a good worker, you have an intertwined excellence, engagement, and ethics. And if you're interested in the training of good workers, as we are, you have to work on these three E's, these intertwined strands of ENA. Number two, what's alignment? Alignment is a multisyllabic word for meaning everybody involved with the profession wants the same thing. And when people are aligned, it's easier to do good work. So what we found back in 2000, 22 years ago, is the field of genetics, doing research in genetics, genetics was well aligned. The researchers, the funders, the uh, medical recipients of information, families, all wanted the geneticists to do their work and they didn't get in the way. This may be less true in 2022, we don't know, but in 2000, genetics was a well-aligned field of science. Journalism could not have been more different. Journalists, you have editors who want to do one thing, reporters a second thing, owners of the press a third thing, people who read a fourth thing, um, people who advertise a fifth thing. So journalism was massively misaligned, and it's much harder to do good work when the different stakeholders have different ideas about what they want. And a very telling result is we talked to about 100 geneticists and 100 journalists back 25 years ago. We didn't speak to a single journalist who, no, sorry, we didn't speak to a single geneticist who wanted to leave the profession. They all loved what they were doing, studying genetics and trying to figure out how that affects health and well-being. On the other hand, a third of the journalists whom we interviewed wanted to leave the field of journalism. And this was 22 years ago. And everything we know with the, the rise of the, the internet and social media and uh, uh, what's called uh, um, alternative facts uh, and different forms of truth make journalism an even less attractive field. So that's the third, the second finding is the importance of alignment. The third finding is a sense of responsibility. We ask everybody to whom or what do you feel responsible? This was an incredibly powerful question. In fact, we ended up writing a 400 page book called Responsibility at Work, just discussing how different stakeholders in different fields, in different professions, think about responsibility. Now, this diagram is pretty self-explanatory if you think about age and stage of development. Young people feel mostly responsible to themselves, to me, then to others, people in their family, to friends. Then as they begin to become workers, they feel a certain amount of responsibility at the workplace. And typically, it stops there. But some older people whom we call trustees end up feeling not just responsible to their workplace, but to the whole field of law or medicine or science or journalism or education. And they become real leaders, not just of their own profession. And then the most impressive people are people who believe that they have responsibilities to the whole society. Uh, we can think of someone like Mahatma Gandhi, who didn't just think about his own group or his own profession, but thought about not just India uh, at the time, but about the, the, the whole world. In general, as I say, young people are mostly uh, feel responsible to themselves, and those circles widen with age. But most of you will know, at least by reputation, Greta Thunberg, the Swedish leader who isn't yet 20, who since the age of 10 has been fighting a worldwide battle for awareness of climate change. She's that rare individual who at a very young age has a sense of responsibility to the larger world. And from what we know about Gandhi and other leaders like Nelson Mandela, they also begin with a very wide sense of responsibility. We would like to think, well, we figured out what good work is, now we're just gonna package it and sell it and everybody will become a good worker. But it's not an automatic sell. That was a jolt to us. Um, so 20 years ago, actually 18 years ago, Wendy Fishman and I, two other people wrote a book about making good, how young people cope 
with moral dilemmas at work. And one of the powerful but depressing findings from this study is young people, 15, 20, know what good work is. They respect it, but they say that it's for later. When they're older and more successful and more powerful, then they can do good work. But meanwhile, they want to have a past. They want to be able to become rich and wealthy and successful, and then they'll do good work, and they'll be damned if they relinquish the chance for good work to somebody else who is less scrupulous than they are. So for many young people, not for Greta Thunberg, obviously, or uh, Nelson Mandela, good work is for a later day. And uh, I have a couple of uh, uh, supports for this. This is a spoof from an American newspaper. Recent graduate figure she might as well do good in the world until the economy picks up. So good work is a frill here, not a major strand in her life. Then this is a true story from about a decade ago. 125 students at Harvard, the school where I teach, turned out to have cheated on a final exam. And uh, this was a big scandal. The amusing part of it, if you can be amused by this, this was in a course called Introduction to Congress. And since the United States Congress deservedly has a very poor reputation, Senate and House of Representatives, perhaps it's not surprising that many people who took that course cheated, and they got various penalties. We could discuss uh, how the university dealt with this. I don't think the university dealt with it very well. This is an article from the New York Times. When there's a scandal at Harvard, it becomes national, if not international, news. So two decades later, after the good work study, the study of responsibility, the making good study of young people, we have launched something called the goodproject.org. And the goal of that project is to help people in general, but young people become good workers. And you can learn as much as you want about the Good Project by going to the goodproject.org. But I want to just tell you about a few of the things we've done, and then we'll move to the last two parts of the talk. In education, our team is developing lesson plans to inculcate good work in students. It focuses on high school students, but it can be used secondary school students. It can be used with younger students, and we're using it in college and professional schools. And indeed, you could use it anywhere where good work, work that's excellent and ethical and engaging, is part of your goal. Let me give you just two examples of, of dilemmas in our good work toolkit. Sydney is the editor of her high school newspaper. She's a good editor. Her grandfather was a writer for the New York Times. There's a rape on campus, very serious. That should be in the newspaper. Everybody should know about it. But she's called in by the headmaster, and the headmaster says, look, Sydney, you can't publish this because if you do, the school will get a bad reputation. People will, won't come here next year, and so you have to keep it a secret. So she's very confused. She goes home, tells her mother the story, and her mother says, I'm so proud of you, Sydney, for standing up for your ethics. But you know, your grandfather would be proud of you, but your, your younger brother wants to go to that school next year, and if you get in trouble, maybe he won't be admitted. So this is a real ethical dilemma for Sydney, and I hope it would be an ethical dilemma for anybody who hears that story. What do you do when there's a rape and people need to know about it, but you're not supposed to talk about it? A very different kind of dilemma. This is Mike. He's a wonderful chemistry teacher. Kids love him. Good teaching manner. Uh, kids uh, learn a lot of um, chemistry, a lot about science. But they come in to complain to Mike. Mike, they say, you're terrific and we really like you, but you're too tough a grader. Your grades aren't high enough. And so students in other classes get higher grades and they do better in college ranking. They do better in getting into the college they want. So we want you to just raise everybody's grade. And Mike's a dilemma because he has high standards and he doesn't want to give grades to students who don't deserve it. So again, these are not dilemmas where there's a simple, straightforward answer. If you think it's obvious what to do, you haven't taken the dilemma seriously. But these are the things which we find that students, and interestingly teachers, like to grapple with. And we would like to believe that it helps to make them into better workers. Here's a fun thing. We give everybody 
30 values on 30 sheets of paper, and we asked them to rank them from the most important value to the least important value. Um, and if you have good eyesight, you can see that uh, they range from spirituality to professional conduct to courage. And the students just rank them and put them aside. And you, many of them become very engaged. They get on the floor and they move the papers all around. But then later, perhaps the next week, they're asked to make a pie chart about how they spend each day, how much time they spend sleeping, being with friends, being on social media, in school, studying, fooling around, playing games, uh, being on Facebook, etc. And uh, the teachers uh, uh, encourage them to um, compare how they spend their days, how they spend their lives in accordance with their values. And often it's a huge wake-up call because you might say that faith is very important or curiosity is very important or telling the truth is very important, but you don't spend any time doing that. And again, we hope that this produces some disequilibrium with students and helps them think more about their sense of responsibility. And as I've said, teachers often find these absolutely interesting too. They're not just for 15 years old, they're for anybody who cares about what kind of a person they are and what kind of a worker they are. So let's say you wanted to know what factors encourage good work. We've identified three, and they're easy to describe. One is vertical support, help from people who are older, experienced, more knowledgeable than you, though not the editor, not the head of the school, I would say, uh, who didn't want people to know about the rape. Second is horizontal support. Your peers, what do they value? Your group, your play group, your work group, your um, after school group. And then what we call wake up calls. When something very good happens, you know, uh, let's say Greta Thunberg addresses the United Nations effectively, or when something very bad happens, like a huge cheating scandal at a major university, how do you interpret that? How do you react to it? How do you learn from it? And if you have vertical support, horizontal support, and reflect on these wake-up calls or booster shots, you're more likely to become a good worker. Here's another graphic. Three sources of support, parents, teachers, students, and their peers. So I've um, spent a lot of time talking about what we did in the Good Work Project. I've given you some of the findings and concepts. Um, I then said that we've become interested in the last years in trying to encourage good work, not just to understand it, but to promote it. And I've given you um, some concepts like vertical support, horizontal support, and wake-up calls, which can help to achieve good work. But how do we know whether we're successful? How do we know um, whether we have had impact? And in the next part of the talk, that's the question that I'm going to try to answer. Impact is a word that we use quite readily. Um, and if you think about it, uh, it probably comes initially from physics, where you have different forces having effects one another. Um, on the bottom, I put a, a, a photograph of uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in the movie Don't Look Up, <laughs> a movie about uh, a comet that's about to hit the Earth, and that would have had a lot of impact. And those of you who, well, if you haven't seen the movie, I won't tell you what happened, but uh, hitting a comet, having a comet hit the Earth is a lot of, a lot of impact. But when you're um, looking in any field, you can talk about the ideas um, and the practices that impact. Here you see Newton, Einstein, Galileo, each of whose have changed our understanding of the physical world and what we can do with the mechanics and the, the bombs and so on. Also in education, the various devices which have been invented that have impact, slide rule, Skinner box, distance learning, and then something called the book and printing, which of course has had a lot of impact in, in education. And then there are people who have impact in education. 
These faces are probably not so well known to you, though their names may be. On the left, you have Maria Montessori, who had enormous impact on the early education of children. On the right, you have A.S. Neal, who started the Summerhill Schools, which leave all the agency for education in the hands of the young people. And in the middle, the man who had enormous influence um, on United World Colleges, International Baccalaureate, Expeditionary Learning, Kurt Hahn, the, the, uh, the German-British educator from uh, the earlier part of the 20th century. So you can have impact in different fields, and you can have impact in different ways. Um, so let's go back to the good project. Um, if we wanted to know whether our writings, we've written 10 books and countless articles, or our curricula, which are posted, um, or our courses, which we've given for many years, after having impact, you have to ask who are the key players whom you're trying to impact? What are the key ideas? Have they been understood? What are the key practices? Things like the value sort and the dilemmas. What are the effects? Can you demonstrate short-term effects, middle-term effects, long-term effects? There are probably millions of young people who know about Greta Thunberg and her ideas about climate change. Some of them may be affected immediately, others over a much longer period of time. Then as architects of a program, like a good project, we need to ask, are we trying to affect teachers, principals, heads of schools, trustees, laggards, people who are potentially the hardest ones to reach? Are we trying to reach the more general public, parents, uh, readers of the newspaper? Uh, and then, uh, do we want to have many small impacts? Or one major impact? I, I can't help thinking about the comet that's about to hit the Earth. That would be one major impact of a, of a negative sort. Of course, if we found a, a cure for COVID, that would have an impact of a very positive sort for the entire planet. Or are we more hoping to get a modest effect in many different people in different places? So even if you... Um, have just developed some ideas and you want to know whether they work, these are the kinds of questions that you need to ask if you want to know whether you're having impact. And of course, you may not be. Or worse, you might be having impact, different, counter-impact, bad impact. Uh, there's some studies, in fact, that uh, sometimes ethics courses in secondary school make young people less ethical. And we could discuss for a long time whether that's the case and whether that's a short-term or a long-term uh, effect. The important point, which I always um, stress to my research team, is you don't want to fool yourself. You don't want to say, well, we've got a great program and people are smiling and giving it a, a straight A. You don't want to assume that it has an effect. You have to go and figure out the right ways to assess, the right ways to measure whether you're having impact. So United World College was approached us at Harvard in an organization called Project Zero uh, about five years ago, and they said, we would like to know um, whether being a United World College campus, most of them are two years, though so, uh, SEA goes for uh, entire educational pre-university span, we'd like to know whether we're having impact, and if so, of what sort. We knew a bit about United World Colleges. We knew a lot about research. We've done research in many different avenues. We were in the middle of a Ten-year study of higher education in the United States, which has just been published in a book called *The Real World of College*. So we were intrigued about the possibility of doing a study with the United World Colleges, and so we said yes. But we stressed we have to be independent. We have to go where the data take us, and we can't just give you a finding that makes you feel good. We're going to try to give you findings which will be helpful to you. So that's the the UWC study, which was just completed a few months ago. Here's how we ask the questions with respect to good work. How do we measure the impact of good work ideas and practices? And how effective are materials? You have to ask the same thing with respect to UWC. How do we measure the impact of UWC ideas? 
practices, and important though challenging question, how effective are our materials compared with others designed for similar purposes and carried out in other places? So that's the mindset growing out of the Good Work Project and out of the um, college study that we brought to bear on our study of impact in the UW UWC system. So here are the Trepid investigators. Uh, on the left, Shelby Clark. On the right, Danny Misinskis. They traveled to almost all campuses because of the pandemic. There were two out of 18 that they couldn't go to. And they spent real time there observing, talking to students, talking to teachers, attending classes. But then in addition, um, we sampled thousands of students um, at the different campuses, the different UWC campuses all over the world. Um, and we also um, got in touch with many alums uh, via the international office and asked them about their experiences. Um, we collected a lot of data a lot of data, and we have just completed a summary report. You can see the cover there, um, Educational Experiences and Outcomes at UWC, an Investigation of Impact. And I hope the word impact now has been complexified and problematic, problematized for you. It's not something you can simply take the temperature and say, yes, we're success, or yes, we, we didn't do what we wanted to do. A very, very important thing. Let's say we got all sorts of results about the United World College network, maybe the whole network, maybe some of the schools. To what extent is it due to the United World College um, platform, programs, courses, mission statements, um, IB curriculum? You can't answer that question unless you have comparison schools. And so we insisted on having 10 different comparison schools against around the world, and while we couldn't study them with the same intensity that we studied the UWC campuses, we surveyed them. We even surveyed alums in some cases. And this was essential if we wanted to separate out what effects are due to the UWC mission and program, as opposed to effects which might happen at any school that was internationally oriented uh, and had resources to provide a decent education, sometimes an IB education, sometimes it's equivalent. So over four years, we studied and visited the UWC campuses, and we also studied and surveyed and gave many different kinds of instruments, psychological tests, which we, we made up psychological tests, which were well known, and we gave those all around the world. So the report. The report is big, over 300 pages. Fortunately, for those people who want to get the gist, there's an executive summary, about 30 pages, and that gives the highlights. But for any of you who wants to want to get into the weeds, um, we have four substantive chapters, one focusing on learning and pedagogy, the second on the sense of belonging and the mental health of students, a third on the state admission, as opposed to how mission was actually understood by the different constituents, uh, um, teachers, alums, students, and then, very, very important for the goals of UWC, what kind of impact short-term, middle-term, long-term does participation in UWC, usually for two years, though, at SEA for many more years, and then the end of the report, but we separate our uh, recommendations from our findings because they're two very separate endeavors. So the report is just about to be posted, and we encourage you very much to read it, study it, debate it, um, which has, as it were, a second life of um, our study. Um, and here are some of the things you might think about and talk about. These are our questions which we raise. I'll just give you the highlights. Number one, is UWC a coherent movement, or is it just a set of loosely coupled places and ideas? Number two, how do different constituents on the campus, the leaders, the teachers, the students, beginning students, ending students, and students from, the, from that country, that part of the world, students from elsewhere, um, 
How, do they see the things in the same way? There are many, many features of UWC, in class, outside of class, community service, extra activities, um, the, uh, the, the, the national committees. Which features are more central? Which ones would be easiest to relinquish and why? What's the role of the IB? Very controversial. What's the role of, of required national curriculum or exams? Then we saw students ideally four times over the course of the two years. We saw them by, by a survey. What effects can you see over the two years? What effects if people go to a longer term school like SEA? What effects can be seen with alums? And we, we separated the recent alums from the alums of many years ago. Are they the same effects? Are they desired? Are they expected? Or are they paradoxical, like I mentioned, where one ethical course actually made high school students be more cynical about ethics? And then most important, and what we insisted on, um, how do UWC schools compare with other schools of the same general kind, internationally oriented um, uh, schools from different parts of the world? Um, What's unique, what might be special, as opposed to what's likely at any select secondary school, which even if you called it the AWC or the ZWC, you would get the same results. These are hard questions. I can't claim we have the ultimate answer to either, but I can say we have a much better way of thinking about it uh, than we had five years ago. And I hope that's true for the movement as a whole. That would be the real criteria of the success of you rate of the success of our study as the impact study opened up new ideas and led to um, promising kinds of conversations and changes. So we've covered a lot of ground in the last uh, 30, 40 minutes. I began to talk by talking about the Good Project, which my colleagues and I have been involved with for over a quarter century. Most of the time was spent doing research and writing books. But then we began to think about, is what we've done effective? And that's a question of impact. So we thought about impact in general, because you have impact in any field, from politics to science to entertainment. And then what's impact in education? What are the machines, the mechanisms, the ideas, the, uh, the people? I could have mentioned uh, John Dewey, a very, very powerful influence in education. And then, without making any claims that I could really discuss a 350-page paper in a few minutes of a, uh, of a recorded conversation, I talked about the structure of our study, what we looked at, and some questions that you might be thinking about as you read about our study. I should also mention that we've written reports for the individual schools, which they will get and be in a position to use, and we've also written reports for the comparison schools. And this is what I call the professionalism of researchers. We could just have done what we said we were going to do, but we felt a responsibility to the whole field. And so we will have a website and we'll be writing about our own thoughts in the period to come. And I end with a salute to you. Here's to good work in education across the globe. Thank you very much for your kind attention.